Thank you. Um, before I get started on the topic at hand, I found the conversation before coffee very interesting about sort of community-led digital recording. And we're actually um, partners on a, um, as Sally mentioned, Jeff, uh, Stuart Jeffries, and he's working on a project called the Accord Project. And I urge you all to have a look at the blog with that project, because it's a sort of, co uh, it's about community um, co-production of digital um, and 3D scans and digital data. And they are actually producing, they've actually got enough funding to get a 3D scanner and they are producing scaled models of some of our adopter monument sites um, so their groups, our groups can then take them out to schools and to um, exhibitions and things like that. So I urge you all to have a look at that blog because it, it is a very interesting project and hopefully the first of many. Um, but back on to why I'm actually standing in front of you today. Um, with um, As, it, as uh, Jack said, my name is Cara Jones and I work on the Adopt a Monument project. And today I'm going to talk to you about one of our outreach projects. Um, for the last sort of two years, we've been working in partnership with the Dundee Bay Stick T Connect project. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project itself, the work we've completed and the archaeological remains that we've identified. So hopefully this talk will have a little bit of everything for everyone here. But first I wanted to recap about really what a Doctor Monument is. There's actually a couple of our group members in the audience, so I apologise for boring you again about what we do. Um, but we're a community heritage scheme and we're committed to providing active engagement opportunities for anyone and everyone who would like to get actively involved in their local heritage. Essentially, we help community heritage groups conserve, record and promote historic monuments in their local area. And we can, as you know, we've detailed up there, help with a variety of tasks from fundraising to training to advice about health and safety insurance. And from me, as you can see from the slide there, we work throughout Scotland. We've got a few blank areas, but we're going to fill those in in the next couple of years. Um, but we, um, we work throughout Scotland on a large variety of projects, from Neolithic chambered cairns to World War II air bases. Our project um, is running for five years and we're currently halfway through. So at the moment we're working with about 35 community groups, um, as I say, spread out Scotland. So um, again, as, as I say, some of our groups are in the audience here. Sometimes I take ages to reply to emails. It's not because I'm rude, I'm just usually out in the field. Um, but the most important aspect about our scheme is it's community-led. And we help when and where our groups need us, but it's really up to the community about the type of heritage or archaeology they want to adopt. With our current phase of Adopt a Monument, we're trying something a bit different with our outreach projects. And our outreach projects are really aimed at developing new heritage audiences. We're trying to provide active engagement opportunities to audiences that perhaps haven't had the opportunity to engage with heritage and archaeology. And we're doing this by working in partnership with established charities. So we've completed a project with the homeless charity Crisis, and we've completed another project up in the Highlands with the domestic abuse charity Women's Aid, as they all have these established audiences um, ready and raring to go, so we can sort of um, pop up and do these um, heritage projects. We're finding that with our heritage projects, um, our outreach projects generally look at more modern and perhaps more non-traditional heritage. And perhaps because outreach projects, um, perhaps it's because our outreach audiences can identify with this heritage, they can put it into, their co into context and perhaps engage with it more rapidly. I'm not sure how current Shaken Stevens is really now. Oh, that, you can't really see it, it says Shaken Stevens rules, okay. I'm not sure how current he really is anymore. Um, so taking all of this into account, um, in 2012 we were contacted by Anne Lolly, um, who is in the background of the picture here, I think doing star jumps to keep warm because it was such a cold day. Um, but Anne Lolly is from the Dickety Connect project, she's been working on that project for about six or seven years. Um, and she got in touch with us to see if we might be able to provide some heritage based activities and trainings, uh, training to various communities she's been working with along um, with the Dickety Connect project. As the name suggests, the Dickety Connect project is centred on the Dickety Burn, which is a watercourse that essentially encircles Dundee. I really apologise, I haven't actually got a map showing the Dickety, which is outrageous. Um, but this burn, it kind of, it's, um, it goes into the Tay around uh, Broughty Ferry, and it sort of encircles um, Dundee, and it really goes up and beyond the A90. So it's a really nice sort of physical almost embankment for Dundee. Um, 
And what's interesting about the Dickety is there's quite a lot of different communities living alongside this watercourse. And the Dickety Connect project uses this physical link to connect these different communities along the burn. These communities have in the past interacted with the burn in different ways. But at the end of the day, the burn is actually a really large, valuable green space to a lot of these communities. The Dickety Connect project has been trying to link these communities in a variety of ways, through guided walks, talks, ecological surveys, artwork installations, media work. So they wrote and filmed local people's stories, and some of them are on YouTube. So again, I urge you to look them up, because some of them are very funny. Um, they also produce poetry. They have some resident puppets called the Dickety Dwellers. You name it, and they've probably had a go at producing it. This dynamic way of disseminating knowledge of the, the knowledge of the Dickety is really down to the energy and enthusiasm of Anne. As some of you may have seen her talk at um, the community conference last year. I think um, one of my favourite phases, phrases from Anne is, um, within reason, anything goes. She's really um, a fantastic project partner to work with and she's um, made it an absolute joy. Um, working... As a, for us as archaeologists as well, working with the Dickety Connect project really opened up our eyes to the different ways we can disseminate our knowledge of, of heritage, the different ways we can sh of how we can share that, our knowledge of heritage. Um, and it's working, as I say, this project's really taught us so much on that, um, on the, these different ways of disseminating um, uh, our knowledge. And we are definitely applying those to other Adopt a Monument projects. But one point this project um, has really brought home for us was that by working with so many different communities, you see so many different interpretations of this landscape. This slide shows a substantial heritage feature, and as a heritage professional, I recognise this with a little bit of research as a 19th century aqueduct. And with a little bit more research, I can find out that it's a Category B listed structure, and therefore it's probably considered to be of regional importance. But to the people that actually live next to it, and it spans um, a sort of green space area between two housing schemes, um, this bridge actually, or aqueduct, actually has huge cultural significance. And it's actually the spot where rival gangs used to meet 20 years ago to discuss the matters at hand, or rather not to discuss things. So that's how those local people see this monument. It's, um, it's a meeting place where good and bad things and negative things happened. And we found this theme repeating itself throughout the project. Features we would recognise and record as heritage assets, local people would tell us stories such as, we used to play around there, we used to cross the river around there, so around a, a weir, we used to cross the river over there. Um, it's a very lived-in landscape. So we started to do a bit of, once we, we sort of met Anne and we worked out we, we really wanted to work, on, work with her on this project, we started to do a bit of research to identify some project themes of what we might be able to do. A cursory look at cartographic sources showed that the Dickety once played a very important part within Dundee's industrial heritage. It's chock-a-block full of mills, bleach fields and associated features. Um, there's a great website called Nine Trades um, that has a really good summary of, um, of the Nine Trades of Dundee, as, it, as the title suggests. But on there, there's also a great paper by a local um, historian called Enid Gauldy. I don't know if she's here today. Um, but she's written a paper on the mills along the Dickety, which really gives them, um, really sort of lets, um, sort of lays out the historical context of the mills. Um, so I really, again, if this interests you, you should have a look at it, because it's really good. Um, but you can see here on the Audience Survey First Edition map that some of the features um, here, um, you know, some of the features that were along the Dickety. So you can see, here's the watercourse coming down. Oh, sorry, that's a rose. Not a good start. So here's the watercourse coming down here. And these are all the associated features that are all basically there because of this water source. This georeference map shows how much used to be here. So this is Dundee Bleach Works, and you can see the rather large complex of associated features that used to be here, and you can see how um, the modern sort of post-war post advancement of Dundee has effectively wiped out a lot of these features. Um, again, if you look at the um, past map, if you look at, you know, on the NMRS, there's very little features recorded along the Dickety Burn. Um, so I wasn't sure if that was because there's nothing there, or perhaps um, someone hasn't had a chance to have a look at it yet. Um, luckily, 
um, our initial site visits identified there were several surviving features hidden in the undergrowth um, or at the edge of redeveloped land. So the two questions we really wanted to ask with this project was what has been there and what still survives? So we worked with quite a few different audiences um, and our three main ones were the uh, Whitfield Local History Group who we assisted with mapping. Um, they were really interested in the lades and the sluice gates but were finding it challenging to correlate the cartographic evidence with the modern landscape as it had changed so dramatically. So we helped them by producing georeference maps so they could go out and spot features. We also did a lot of work with Bravey Academy um, and we also worked with a fantastic pool of um, volunteers who were already involved with the Dicty Connect project. One um, group Anne was particularly keen to work with was Bravey Academy, which is a high school situated fairly close to the, our study area. The school decided that a lower tier English class um, of about sort of 12 to 13 year olds should work with us and quite a few of these children had learning disabilities, behavioural issues. I actually thought they were fantastic, they were really hard working but they've had issues with um, other sort of group tasks and things like that. Um, we did about five sessions with this class looking at a lot of heritage themes um, from the work, you know, you know, ranging from the work of an archaeologist. We did, um, again, cursory desk-based assessment with them. We brought replica finds in so they could do object handling, <coughs> storytelling. Um, we did have quite a few one-direction chariot races, but, you know, as Anne says, anything goes. Um, and also, um, really get them to start thinking about archaeology and materiality. We asked them to bring in an object that was important to them and how it reflected themselves and their lives today. So really getting them to think about how we as archaeologists construct our stories. Um, we also wanted to get them out and about along the Dickety, but we didn't want to alienate them by getting them to sort of record quite um, maybe niche interests, um, sluice gates and bits of lades and bits of dry stone walling. Um, so we went out and got them recording graffiti, but we um, encouraged them to look at it and record it as an archaeologist would when encountering um, an upstanding archaeological feature. Um, so we used, you know, we produced, um, helped them produce like field recording sheets, we used handheld GPSs, we lent them an SLR camera, it was quite fun downloading some of those photos. Um, we got them to think about the work of an archaeologist while working with this very modern materiality. What was really lovely about our work with Brave, Brave View is that the teachers said that it was, they were very surprised at how engaged the children were. They usually have very short attention spans, they're quite used to playing up, but in our session they were brilliant, very hard working, um, and only one of them actually fell in the river during our field work, so it was, it was a really big win. Um, the other big aspect of our work was to identify and record any potential remains um, of the Dickety um, you know, relating to its very um, substantial industrial past. Um, as I mentioned previously, we knew from cartographic evidence that the Dicty once held um, large complexes of mills and bleach fields along its banks. Working with a pool of Dicty Connect volunteers, we ran several training workshops um, showing volunteers how to identify and record upstanding archaeology. <coughs> And the volunteer that really took on the mantle, and he's here today, um, is David Drummond. Pretty much all of the new sites that have been recorded were recorded by David. Um, he came along to a couple of workshops, and then a few months later, Anne got in touch with me to say David had found some features. And when I met up with him, um, I got handed this amazing wad of detailed record sheets, photographs, detailed site locations of the 21 new sites that he'd identified. Um, and to say that I felt like a proud mum is a massive understatement. Because <laughs> it's so rare when that actually happens. It was brilliant. Um, so you can see here, this is the site of Dundee Bleachfields. Um, and as I mentioned before, Many of these features now have gone. I think this here is a bingo hall, which I'm sure... Is that right? Is it a bingo hall? Is anyone local here? No? Um, I think that's a bingo hall, but basically a lot of these original features... Is it... We're waiting for verification on the bingo hall. Anyway, moving on. Um, so, as you can see here, there's a lot of sort of dispersed features. Um, they're all related to the Dickety, basically. And so we wanted to see how many of these features or how many um, uh, associated features might still survive. Um, I say not much did survive in that area. Oh, sorry, this photo is very dark. But what David did identify, you can see, is the old boundary wall 
to the beach works and the um, entrance way to the beach works. So this is a really sort of almost inconspicuous wall. You'd probably drive past it and never even notice it, and yet it's a very powerful physical link to the industrial past in that immediate area. Um, this is the site of Douglas Beachworks, um, which was um, basically first redeveloped, well, de first developed for the Bleachworks, um, and then a high school. You see this outline of a building here. That was a massive high school that actually only got demolished about five or six years ago, I believe, since Saviour's High School. Um, what was really lovely about this area was that everyone had memories of the high school. Um, I think the reason it got demolished was because it kept flooding. So there were lots of local stories about how this area kept flooding. Um, with the mill lays and massive mill pond, I really wonder why. Um, but it's, it's really quite interesting to see how we, again, we look at it in that we're looking for this industrial pass. And obviously everyone remembers the high school, but, still, but they also remember seeing bits and pieces of features which still might survive. Um, so, one, so while most of these features here, again, have gone, if you look at sort of this part mill laid here, and that sluice where, where there was a sluice gate there, that sluice gate still survives. So again, I, I don't think this, this one might be recorded because it's, so, um, it's quite substantial, but again, it's a sort of quite powerful um, reminder of this very big industrial past along with Dickety um, that's just there in front of people. Um, to the east of St. Saviour's, you have a very long mill laid um, going all the way around there. Um, so here is playing field, so that's where it's being completely filled in. And then on the other side of that playing field, you've got this open area and you've got the mill laid surviving. When we went to go have a look at this um, about a month ago, we actually wondered if it had been, because St. Saviour's has had such a massive issue with flooding, we, want, we think it's been enlarged because that's a rather large mill laid, um, to try and combat the flooding of St. Saviour's, but it didn't quite work. But again, it's sort of just by going off the beaten track and looking for these features, you can find remnants of them. Again, on this map, you can see here, I mean, this is on the modern map, so we knew that the weir probably still survived. Um, and although I don't have a good picture of the weir, the shopping trolleys helpfully um, define it, because it's sort of there and they're sort of on top of it. Um, and behind me in this picture, again, I didn't quite have a good picture of it, is another sluice gate. So again, these sort of very, sort of very small, less, perhaps lesser important features are still surviving. With Balloony Bleach Works, um, again, there were a lot of associated features, um, and again, a lot of these have been demolished with the big post-war advancement. Um, one thing that's quite interesting that we've not actually marked on here is these terraced houses here are actually on the second edition, Ordnance Survey second edition map, and those terraces still survive and they're still lived in. Um, so it's likely they were worker houses associated with this complex here. So again, this is um, quite a modern sort of industrial area now, so I th I'm pretty sure a lot of these buildings have um, been demolished. It'd be quite fun to go in and um, maybe ask permission to go in and, and have a look. But if you note again this mill laid coming down in this way and this sort of outflow there, hidden again in the undergrowth is that rather nice outflow um, which is linked again to that balloony bleach field. And again, this hasn't been recorded previously. Um, this feature here actually, I'm not so much personally attached, but it's, um, it was the first feature that we identified that made us actually quite hopeful that there were features surviving and that we would actually have something to do on the project, which is always a positive thing. Um, so what's been really the purpose of this project? Well, we've engaged with about 30 to 40 local um, residents that haven't really had a chance at doing archaeology or heritage before. Um, our work with the school led to a temporary exhibition within the school produced by the children we worked with, um, detailing their work with us and some of the work they went on to do after we, um, after we finished working with them. We, or rather David, recorded 21 new sites which are currently being written up and will be submitted to the local SMR, the NMRS and obviously DES as well. So these sites will now be added to the record and will you know, hopefully be recorded, you know, well, 
everyone could be able to have a look at them, because I think they're rather nice. Um, and while these sites are very small and perhaps considered to be, you know, in planning terms, perhaps because to be like of lesser importance, they really are the sort of only visual upstanding reminders of the Dickety's industrial important past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cara. I think it's fascinating to see how um, the Adopt a Monument scheme is being able to introduce non-traditional audiences to the delights of falling in the Dichty Bird. Yeah, it's great fun. <laughs>